Take five, five questions to authors and artists. With a common question, we get a personal perspective on what shapes their views. Shama Pereira. Welcome to Audiobook Radio. Thank you. Writer and journalist and a good friend. Yes. Uh, I w- wanted to ask you uh, five questions, the first of which is, is there a book that actually inspired you to write? Um, no, not really, because I ended up writing books by accident. Um, so my inspiration all through childhood was newspapers and music papers particularly. I used to um, get all of them with my uh, earnings from Boots the Chemist where I worked every night after school. So I can remember disc, record, mirror, melody maker, new musical express, sounds. I used to buy all of them every week, read them cover to cover and want to be a journalist. That was what I wanted to be. And I never saw myself as a writer in the sense of long form or novels. Um, I just saw myself as a hack. Um, But I fell into writing simply by accident. I needed to make some money one Christmas. And I sent uh, an idea to an agent called the, uh, the, what was it called? The Bucks and Butter Eaters Bible. We're big and we're bold, so bugger off. Um, and I sent this to, to this chap who sent, who, well, he, he didn't send me back a note. He rang the next day because um, obviously in those days, you know, mail got there the next morning. And he said, uh, you've got a great writing style. This book idea is rubbish. You ought to write a novel. And he, then he gave me this formula and it worked and blah, 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 blah. And that's how I ended up writing. So I was never one of those people who used to read novels and go, <gasps> I want to write something like this, or I wish I could write. I didn't think I could. Uh, I don't think I'm a great writer anyway. I think I'm a very good writer, but I don't think I'm a great writer. And I fell into writing so that there was no eureka moment where you look at something and go, oh, this is what I want to do. Okay, can I just backtrack? Because I don't deign to be smarter than your agent, but that seemed like a great idea. I thought it was was a great idea. It was going to be a Christmas annual, and we would update it every single year, and you would have kind of positive stories about women of size. You would never pretend it was healthy. What What it would be about would be about being big and beautiful and and fit so it wasn't about oh you know let's all slob out like I don't know Kathy Burke in one of her films and uh, and pretend that's great it was about being like Oprah it was about being like me at that time <laughs> um, it was it was saying actually let's just celebrate ourselves but it was also a sort of slightly joke book so you'd buy it for your mate at Christmas mm. or you'd buy it for your girlfriend or you'd buy it for your mum and it would be full of all sorts of jolly before and after pictures it would be full of fashion it would be full of stories across the year about women of size and it would be um it would just be this sort of bible that would make you laugh you have a fantastic slogan remind me of that the bucks and butt eaters bible we're big and we're bold so bugger off i just think you're on a winner there I, yeah i, I thought i was on a winner planning. maybe i got the structure of it wrong but anyway the the, the agent was called peter robinson and he just said uh, you know, this is rubbish, but you ought to be turning this writing style into a novel. Mm. Um, I think it was probably because it was a very long time ago when people did read, whilst now, when less people read and people want to just dip in and out of annuals and yes. things like that, I well, think you're on a winner. Absolutely, well, even then, I mean, you know, I grew up with annuals, like the Bunty mm. annual, the Blue Peter annual, the June and School Friend annual. And, and the, no, I didn't have an NME annual because oh, right. I was serious by then. I didn't want an annual. I was, I, you know, I was absorbing everything. I flipped me. I could do the, I could do the crossword in the Melody Maker in about two wow. minutes. It was just, wow. uh, those were happy one. days. I only had to listen to the chart once and I knew it. Um, it was really interesting. I was just obsessed with music, which is really hard to believe now when I barely listen to it. So my obsessions bore no relation to what I ended up writing about, mm. although there is music actually in that first novel. Mm. Well, there is yes. in the second novel, actually, but um, it's, it's more important to the first novel. Okay, so is there a book that you've read that you really wish you'd written? Yes. Um, the first book to which I had that reaction, response, was Toni Morrison, Beloved. 
Um, and that was a book I really struggled to get into. It's about a spirit. It's about slavery. It's just the most extraordinarily complex novel and yet it kind of keeps hitting you over the head with facts with emotion and above all a great story i'm an absolute sucker for a great story i don't really mind too much whether the writing style is good or bad though with tony morrison it's fantastic but that doesn't always bother me if there's a good story that's what will keep me reading right to the end but that was the first novel where i read it and i thought oh my gosh why can't i have written something like that and i i I had no pretension about it. I couldn't write something like that because I don't think, and I'm not, this is not putting myself down, this is actually bigging up Toni Morrison. I don't think at the level of Toni Morrison. So I couldn't conceive uh, an idea like that and follow it through. But more recently, I read a very simple novel by Jojo Moyes, um, which has sold half a million copies. So probably half the people listening to this have read it called Me Before You. Um, and that, that was like a sucker punch at the end of every chapter. And it is, the, it's not a great literary work. It is, however, a very, it's a profound and beautifully written. It's written so simply. It's just like reading ABC. Um, but there is so much in it. And I thought, now I can write like this. So why can't I write a novel like this? Well, actually, I can't write a novel like this, certainly at the moment, because I don't have the big stories in my head the way that Jojo Moyes does. But that was another book where I realistically thought at the end of it, I wish I could have written this book or I wish I had written this book. So there are there are books you wish you'd written because you know you'll never write them. And there are books that you wish you'd written because you could write them. <laughs> and, so, mm. and so that's kind of one of each, really. Mm. Yeah. And I don't know if you actually listen to audiobooks. Do um, I do and I don't. I, I'm a huge sucker for podcasts of dramas, of serialisations, of short stories, but I don't physically go out and buy them mm. um, simply because... I suppose I can pick stuff up online when I'm yeah, needing to listen. Well, I'll, I'll download stuff, yes, stories. and I'm just starting something. So is there a book you wish you'd, um, that you'd really appreciate somebody writing, uh, reading to you? So? Well, I've just started training up for something called the Reading Round, which is for the Royal Literary Fund, which is where you read to a group of people every week, um, and then you discuss the short story that you've read. And so... I've been looking at short stories, and, and particularly the short stories of Catherine Mansfield, which are wonderful to read aloud. So I imagine that they're even better to listen back to. My favourite, of course, of all audio is, um, I'm sorry to say, because it must be so populist, is Martin Jarvis doing Just William and that sort of thing. Um, I do enjoy humour uh, and to listen to. The book that I would probably most like to be read to me. Actually, I think I would only like short stories. I don't think I would like, well, I listened to Bill Clinton. Oh my gosh, eight hours in the car. I could not leave um, because uh, listening to Bill Clinton reading his own audio, his, his own book on audio. Um, but I quite like to go through things like the Sherlock Holmes stories, which I find quite difficult to read. I don't mm. enjoy reading them on the page, but I think written by, read to me by an actor or a reader who is really getting into the heart of that story very quickly, um, it would make me appreciate those stories and understand them better than when I'm trying to read them on the page. Mm -hmm. So I think it's all that sort of complex reading and, and, and little bits of reading. I think that's what I like so that I can create the jigsaw in my, I can put the pieces together and create the picture in my head, you know, and, and, and get a, a full sense of what it was that the writer was trying to do because obviously if you're a writer you're not you're not just enjoying the story you're trying to work out what was it that the person who wrote this was trying to do and one of the great things when you hear someone else read it out rather than your own voice reading it to you in your head on the page is that you suddenly get an insight into 
a character or a it's just like watching drama isn't it i mean you know you can watch shakespeare you can watch the same play directed by 10 directors with 10 different casts and each one will give you a completely different sense of how how those characters work together and that's why people go and see the same thing again and again and again and again and it's like that when you hear somebody reading a book to you you see things you hear things in that narrative that you would not have spotted if you'd read it for yourself Mm. yeah totally I agree with that and it seems kind of obvious but you know what until you just said it I was never really conscious of it (laughs) well now you are (laughs) okay and do you think there's anything that doesn't belong between the covers of a book do you mean in terms of language or subject matter anything no I don't I think I know it's quite difficult to read. For me, it's quite hard to read profanity when it's page after page after page. Um, I think I've become better at reading that sort of literature and that sort of novel since seeing a lot of plays where there's all that language. And after a while, you suddenly understand why it's there and it starts to make sense to you. Um, So while I don't particularly enjoy reading profanity, where it's continuous, I can remember actually reading The Catcher in the Rye. And of course, he he refers all the time to son of a bitch. And I was 14 and I was reading it as Sanuva bitch. And I didn't know what a Sanuva bitch was. And I kept reading right through that novel, which I loved. And right on the last page, Gisela, there was this moment where it's on the last page, son of a bitch. And in that second, I was still puzzling over Sanuva Bitch, and I suddenly got what he was saying. And of course, I suddenly thought, oh my goodness, I've read this whole novel not knowing what he was saying. And you get to the end and you think, oh, did I actually really understand any of that novel if I didn't know that that was Son of a Bitch? And... um, you know that for me that was such a revelation because I'd never seen words a word like that or a series of words I suppose turned into one in in this case but I'd I'd never seen that on the page and so I didn't recognize it first of all and secondly by the time I'd understood what it was there for and of course it made perfect sense when I understood what it said and meant it gave the book a whole different spin and that's the thing with any book whether you're listening to it being read to you or you're reading it on the page if the writer put it there they put it there for a reason and it may well be and whether it's a discussion of sex or if it's 50 shades of gray which i've not read though i've got it on the shelves i just can't find those pages and um it's what suits you that's what you should read but should it be prevented from being put on the page simply because you don't like the subject matter or you don't like the language of course not because the writer is trying to bring you something rightly or wrongly and you know you should be open to that or even if you're not you should allow others to be open to it Mm, yeah i'll go with that um obviously i have to pick up on your saying that you've got 50 shades of gray on your shelf (laughs) and you can't find the pages i know i just keep opening it random i just want the dirty bits i can't be bothered to read the whole book i thought they were littered all over well it's my daughter's and i thought it would sort of automatically fall open but it doesn't and so Mm. it's just kind of it's just sitting there i will find it i suppose when i actually sit down and um you know when i'm past the menopause and these things might have an effect again I'll get it off from the shelf and test my own responses to it. I do remember reading a very dark book, a wonderful book, a very literary book actually, called Nothing Natural by Jenny Diskey in the 1980s, which I think would be seen as a precursor to Fifty Shades. Uh, because it certainly goes to places that uh, you would not expect a book to go and there's not much left out um, but it, it, it it's well I presume that there's the same with Fifty Shades actually it's about a, a very dark relationship between a, a man and a woman where the fantasy level gets to such a degree that they start living out scenarios and in order to in in order to bring it to a stop because she feels what they're doing is so dangerous and so bad she accuses him of rape after a set-up situation and it's the most fantastic novel if you can get hold of it do it's very very horny if I may use that term and um but it also you know your conscience is clear reading it because actually it's hard there's there's a clear kind of um 
thought running through it that um, that somehow elevates it. Mm. Um, and that's Jenny Disky. Jenny Disky, nothing natural. Nothing natural. Yes, okay. beautifully written yes, book. Sure. Uh, finally, if uh, there were no books, like Days Before Print, would you have been a storyteller? Yes, but I think I'd have been more an anecdote teller than a storyteller. So um, I think I've discovered. In the last couple of weeks, actually, my mum is 82, I've discovered that anecdote telling runs in our family because she had the most horrendous uh, problem with a dead rat that fell out of her attic and exploded on her landing, let me not say any more. But she has turned that into the best story, and she did it within (laughs) days, into the most fantastic story that you can go and tell anyone. And my daughter does it all the time she just you know if she walked down the road and tripped she would somehow turn that into a really funny story near death you know and and I've always been like that or I used to be like that a bit more tempered after children but I used to be like that all the time so I think a storyteller in the sense of taking the everyday and turning it into a story rather than sitting and absorbing stories around the campfire and then passing them on. I don't think my memory is good enough actually to do that, never was. Um, you know, that's why I was a reporter, because you just do it that day and the next day you don't have to think about it again. And um, so I think that's the type of storyteller, I, which is actually the type of storyteller I am. Mm, totally. But can I just ask, what is the distinction between anecdotes and stories? Is it just length? I think... Anecdotes are short stories. They're almost like everyday flash fiction, right? You know, something happens, I turn it into a very funny little vignette and I tell you it. So it's it's a bit like flash fiction, whereas uh, a novel is a bit like except this is a negative example, but it's the only one I can think of because I'm just thinking of a mate that you and I share who lives about four streets away. A novel is like somebody who, every time you meet them, picks up where they left off last time and goes through the whole blowing thing again. And the good thing with a novel on the page is it ends, but in real life the novel can go on for years. And so it's like, actually it's more like epic poetry, like the story of the ancient mariner. Um, you know, so you, 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 I think all types of story are heard around dinner tables across the land. You hear them, you know, between often women at bus stops, you know, sharing a, sharing a story. And you can tell by listening to it, is that a flash fiction or is it a short story, which is a, uh, a slightly longer story that may take the whole bus ride? Or is it a novel? Because tomorrow when you sit opposite them or next to them, you're going to hear that Fred said this last night, and blah, blah, blah. And that's the novel because it goes on for, for much longer. I get that. Shama Ferreira, thank you very much. Hey, Shama.